Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to call this meeting to order, and uh, I guess it's a special meeting, but not a special meeting. Um, but it is a special meeting for us today, so thank you all for being here. And uh, before we get started, uh, I want to welcome Evan Elf for being with us. Today we have uh, Chairwoman uh, Barbara Eichner from Lonzo County Commissioners and Vice Chairman Paul Buchanan. Thank you for being with us today. We've got a big group. But I think uh, it would be good to start out with, we have several people that were honored this morning, so it probably would be appropriate to ask them to stand up. Um, I have here uh, Sergeant Major Retired Joe Hull, Colonel John Kopka retired. Can you stand for us? Yeah. Uh, along with Sam Bright and Howard Funk, they were honored this morning with the Golden Rule Award for their tremendous uh, volunteerism that they do for our community. And uh, where would we be without you guys? Yeah. Probably, probably, you probably a lot. <laughs> we don't accept your resignation. <laughs> probably a lot wealthier too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, again, thank you and congratulations, and thank you for your community uh, support. Um, before you, you have the agenda, and I will entertain a motion to adopt the agenda if there are no issues with it. I make a motion to adopt, adopt agenda. Okay, I have a motion, and I'll second. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Uh, we have before us uh, some brief reports. I'll turn it over to Glenn so he can lead us. We wanted to talk about events that happened since you last met, and last weekend were both of those events. And um, we will say that weekend was pretty well consumed um, by the events. Um, the first event that we want to just speak to you about was Jazz in the City. And we we'll to just show you a little clip of some video here, and then Teresa Beecham is going to just speak to you a little bit about that. Okay, so that's Jazz in the City. I'm going to let Teresa. We weren't able to hear that in here, but we know it was good music. I'm sorry you didn't get to hear that. Good afternoon. Um, the Jazz in the City was by far the best one they've had. Um, I have heard nothing but gratitude for your support, for sure. They, it was a sold-out crowd. Had to rearrange everything at the last minute in the hotel to um, make room for the seating. And had to turn people away at the door. Uh, yesterday, I got a report uh, yesterday afternoon that we had 30 overnight stays based on the surveys that we got back there at the Marriott. And then um, the band, the high school band that you saw that um, attended the workshop on Saturday morning, they had like nine rooms, I think, at, at a neighboring hotel. They so, Clayton, uh, Clayton, <clears throat> Clayton Band. They, they were awesome. They were most appreciative. The workshop was <clears throat> awesome. Uh, Willie Bradley gave 
you know, some music lessons to the kids and tips and all that. It was it was phenomenal. Everybody had a great time. Thank you. If, I, if I may speak, also I was there. Uh, the uh, and thank God they didn't show me in the film. <laughs> and, uh, but because uh, I was jamming, uh, we, were, <laughs> we, were, we were we were having a good time. But there were three hundred. Give me an example. There were three hundred chairs uh, that were available. And we had to bring in some more. Uh, the maximum capacity was 350. Mm -hmm. So we had to clear it with the fire marshal and everything. But there were just people all over the place. Everybody enjoyed it. Uh, there were three shows, Clayton, and then there was a gentleman on, that you saw on the uh, keyboard, and then it was uh, Willie Bradley, who was a trumpeteer. And it was just a great evening. Everybody enjoyed it. We raffled off a couple of baskets from Wine and Wear. Uh, throughout the uh, proceedings, and we uh, raffled a necklace, earring, and uh, uh, bracelet set from Bradley Jewelers. Uh, they donated. We had over 20 sponsors, uh, and this was by far the best that we've had, and everybody's talking about it. So I just want to thank Teresa and everything. And, and that's truly a testimony of the work that we're doing as far as helping these incubating events and you're a testament to that. Is it third year? It's our third year. Third year? I think it's third yeah. or fourth. It's, uh, I, think it's third. I think it's the third year. Third yeah. year with how many sponsors? We had yeah. 20 sponsors this year. Yeah. Uh, and like I said, uh, we had the maximum capacity was 350. We had over 300 people there. We were pushing maximum capacity, and you know, the hotel facilities were beautiful. Everything was just Perfect. Everything was just perfect. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, uh, and I wish you could have heard the sound because there would have been some heads rocking at this table <laughs> and everything. But jazz is wonderful, and it's uh, we're hoping perhaps to expand it uh, to the summer uh, as well, almost like a Monterey Newport type deal. Uh, if we can find the appropriate place, probably so, get a pretty uh, good turnout in the summer. Do it outside. Absolutely, or mm -hmm. absolutely. But I want to thank Teresa personally for our hard work and the marketing, because that was very key to the success of this. Bill? Chairman, uh, that also illustrates very well the, the need for a facility in this, this community. Thank you. <laughs> you know, Seriously, I mean... No, you I, heard this I conversation over the side. Or not. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm an, really a strong advocate. That's probably why I'm sitting on this board, but I'll tell you what. If we don't get something and take advantage of all the nice hotel, cheap hotel rooms, by the way, Inexpensive. Affordable. Inexpensive. Affordable. Affordable. That's Affordable. a better word. Pardon me, Mike. Thanks, Mike. You're welcome. Thank you, Bill. Mr. Mr. Chairman, <coughs> I'd like to add that uh, this is a demonstration of what this board has, what one of our missions is, and that is to incubate. The first year, um, we were, uh, I think you were very disappointed in, in the attendance and, and how it was going. Here we are in the third year, and they've established themselves as something that is probably going to be ongoing in the community. So we need to keep that in mind as these various things come in front of us, that even though it may not look good in the beginning, uh, if it looks like something that can that can be built upon like this one, uh, we need to remember that because this is a prime example of the incubation that we've uh, strive, strove, striven for, and here we are. Well, and I think... I think we need to add to that that they met some of the matrixes along yeah. the way that <clears throat> kept us having the ability to fund them. Yes, exactly. Because um, there's others that haven't, and so I think it's important to, to note that we have to see progress and we have to be able to quanti mm -hmm. quantify that. So, now, If I heard you right, Teresa, roughly 40 rooms for the whole event? Mm -hmm. Ernie that that first, are accounted for now. Yeah, right. Ernie the first year, maybe three or four? Yeah, I think less than 10. Yeah, um, so there we go. Thank you, Glenn. And now the, the events surrounding the 75th anniversary of the 2nd Marine Division.
That doesn't make you feel good, nothing. <laughs> now she with the jazz and the city music with me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> the background. Music. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the the um, you folks um, gave uh, us permission to pay for a few things there. We were very uh, thankful to do that. We had some great help. Um, Susan Baptist and Amanda Griffin back here from Recreation did some phenomenal work in the all the activities that were down at the park. As you recall, it was on December 9th that we got the request to advance this, and then on December 17th, the uh, mayor met with the general, and he said he wanted to have community interaction. So we did this community celebration um, you know, at the park, as it was, and uh, it was a it was a nice event, and I think that. Um, it really showed how um, you can have a parade down downtown Jacksonville with 5,000 Marines marching down there, and uh, it was an impressive sight. So, kudos to y'all for this. This is a great deal. Any comments? And Richard behind you there was a oh, great hey instigator there. in making things happen here. Mm -hmm. All right. Very proud of the staff, especially Lynn's leadership. Well done. Thank, Thank you. For Thank you. It did produce 40 room nights for the 2nd Marine Division Association. How many? 40. 40. 40. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mike, I'd like to point out, too, that the county contributed financially from our tourism money to awesome. to help facilitate. Absolutely, and forgive me for not saying those words. I'll never forgive you. For <laughs> <that>. <laughs> Already on the bag there. <laughs> the, the county helped us pay. We're not even halfway through. Uh, I'm batting zero. The, uh, the county helped us pay for the food and, well, for parade support, excuse me. Helped us with parade support, and we were very thankful to have that, that, that background. Plus, the county also hosted a veterans area down at the, um, at Jackson, at the New Bridge Street Middle School, which was um, well used, and um, we, there was some great photography that came out of that site also. Thank you. Great hot dogs, too. Yeah. yeah. And one other comment. We did use uh, police assistance from a number of the communities here in the county, as well as uh, police assistance from Wilmington and Greenwood, who are in the local grievances. Thank you. I mean, it was a very proud day. I mean, where else can you live and, and be surrounded by so many young men and women who serve so proudly? And I mean, when you look down that line of green, it's got to make you feel a little proud, you know? It, it's special. I think it's special. Yes, I think you know? we're very fortunate. We're very, we're very uh, honored to, to live here. Colonel, give us a big hoorah for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the other two should apply it. I didn't have any tickets, but I got two hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> they were good. You were, you were, Luckily, you were, sir, I gave you two hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Glenn, is that it? Yes, sir. Okay, let's uh, move on to item number five, strategic outflow. Well, um, obviously, um, you gave us a task of things to do, and we've been reporting to you as um, those items had, um, had advanced. Um, most significantly among them was is that um, you wanted an empirical study um, that was to determine who it is that's staying into our facilities here in, in the Jacksonville Lodging facilities. And so that report was prepared, and um, it was part of what we did with North Star, and so that, that document it was available. And then, of course, um, you wanted some um, ideas to what sport or sport um, could, um, could produce a significant overnight stays in Jacksonville Lodging facilities. And then, what would be a facility that would produce some enduring and sustainable um, uh, support to those sport, sports uh, to do so? And that's where we brought in um, Evan Elk from the um, Sports Advisory. Um, that many of you sat as part of a panel that we um, interviewed many different people and determined that this was um, the best fit for us. They have an impressive track record of not only having um, investigated facilities, but saying no um, to some facilities that were um, looked at and said, um, that's not, it won't make a good fit for you. And um, one thing that um, we will mention, um, Richard, in this, he, he wanted to see some of those where they turned them down um, and said that this study would not um, produce a report that indicated that um, this might not be a good idea for that community. Well, I'm happy to say that um, after much work here and uh, we had public sessions and had people come in and um, speak um, that were particularly from the sports community and talk about um, what type of things they'd like to see. And then that empirical study work took place um, at their place as it was. And um, today he's prepared to give us um, um, an output from that work. And so I introduce to you Evan Elf. He's the vice president of the sports advisory and um, he's been wonderful to work with.
Evan, uh, before you begin, if I could just add a couple of comments. Um, for the last three or maybe three or four years, I lose track of time, when we've had our annual reports, it has been evident from the Sports Commission and the Chamber that um, although we have a significant amount of economic development and revenue from sports or sporting activities, that we were still missing some opportunities. And I think this last year, maybe a year and a half, two years, whatever, um, it was pretty loud and clear of the, the um, amount of opportunities that we were missing by um, not having a multi-purpose complex, an indoor facility, because there's, there's many sports that use those sort of venues, that we were very solid in outdoor facilities but lacked in indoor facilities. And we heard Ashley in the chamber loud and clear. And so that's where the discussions uh, began. And through those discussions, we had partnered with our, our county uh, partners. And, and this is where we're at now through this discussion. So I'll turn it over to Evan. Uh, thank you for being with us. And it's all yours. Appreciate it. Um, first and foremost, <clears throat> thank you all for, uh, for the time today. I know this is the culmination of a lot of work. Um, certainly our team did our work to get the report done. But you have a lot of people around this table who have uh, invested a lot of time and energy and effort into uh, creating the opportunity that's ahead of you. So we're excited to be here today. I'm going to say we the whole time. I'm representing a whole team. Um, and uh, so that's just kind of what you'll hear from me. But uh, in the next few minutes, probably 20 to 25 minutes, I want to give you a really good overview of the information that we uh, came back with based on the information that we mined and the data that we um, discovered and uh, do that through first introducing us, who we are, what we do, uh, giving you a quick project overview to make sure you know exactly what we were engaged for, <clears throat> spending a bit of time on the opportunity analysis, the um, what's the opportunity, why is there an opportunity, and uh, how can we take advantage of the opportunity, and spend the majority of the time on the new facility analysis that we've come back with and recommended as the uh, potential facility that would best meet the goals of the TDA, of the city, of all of the groups, frankly, that we spoke with uh, throughout our time on site and throughout our process. Um, we were not engaged to determine what the exact funding scenario or financing scenario would be, but it's always important to look to that next step. And so uh, give you a quick overview of some common financing options for types of or for these types of facilities and then uh, turn it over to you to ask some questions. So with that, a uh, quick overview of who we are and what we do. Um, the Sports Facilities Advisory and Sports Facilities Management were two companies sort of under one banner. Um, this is an advisory project, which is on the planning um, and then leading into the funding side. So we do look through the analytical side, looking at real-world operations, the data that we can mine, key performance indicators, uh, national benchmarks that we hold and we know because we also manage facilities as to how these facilities perform, what it takes to get them open, what it takes to get them thriving, and what's a good opportunity and, and, and frankly, what's not a good opportunity. We've done this type of work uh, in over $5.5 billion worth of facilities nationally and internationally, indoor and outdoor facilities, sports, recreation, wellness, and entertainment, typically a combination of those. But um, at the heart of everything that we do, despite the fact that we do have relationships with professional teams and professional athletes, and we've done even some international professional stadiums, what we're really driven towards is community work. Um, the, the facilities that we plan, that we manage, um, and that we support are all serving their community in a really meaningful and impactful way through youth and amateur sports, through serving kids and serving families, getting them active. And um, they are really improving the health and the economic vitality of the community. So when we work with uh, a group like the TDA and uh, obviously, you know, sort of by proxy, the city and even the county as well, um, we know that there's a real drive to do something important and impactful through sports. So this is really in our wheelhouse, not only of what we do on the um, output side, but of why we get up in the morning and why we're excited about it. I mentioned that we plan and manage. We also are involved in funding and opening uh, facilities. <clears throat> um, again, this is completely on the left-hand side of, of this sheet um, in the plan and the feasibility, but we always look at the next step. So it's not just about planning because we could come back with the $80 million project that wouldn't be possible to fund, and that doesn't do anyone any good. So we know we want to look through the eyes of realistic fundability and then understanding within the plan 
what it's going to take to get it open on time, under budget, and exceeding the expectations that we've set in our projections, and ultimately what it's going to take to manage this facility successfully. Um, so, you know, with that, obviously, because we do manage facilities, and although there haven't been any detailed discussions about eventual management, we know that the numbers that come back in the pro forma and in the financial forecast have to set up whoever <coughs> the manager is. And our sort of ethic around our projections is that if you were to take the report and turn it back to us and say, would you manage to these numbers, we better be able to say yes, because otherwise we're setting ourselves up for failure, setting you all up for failure. And so we do look through that lens. Um, we have included, we know that the, the idea is that there would be an outside management company, so we have included a budget for that built into this pro forma. Um, but again, it's intended to set whoever the manager up uh, whoever the manager is, up for success and create realistic, reliable, achievable, credible information for you to make the very best decision on. Any questions about who we are, what we do? Perfect. Okay, so uh, project overview, we were really engaged for a two-phase process. The first phase, uh, phase rather, was um, to look at the existing data from what the Sports Commission has done in the past, what the opportunities have been, what the lost business is based on the inability to serve in certain areas or for certain requests, and um, do a market study uh, locally, sub-regionally, and regionally to understand um, more of the existing service providers, more of the people who live here, the regional sports participation, all these pieces of information will um, skim over at a high level here in a moment. And we came on site. We were here for three or four days in total. Uh, there were four of us that traveled to the market. And during that time, we um, toured the market. We saw existing um, facilities and service providers. We spoke with a number of people. We had, obviously, um, a, a fairly large set of conversations, not only with the TDA, but also with representatives from the city, from the county, from Camp Lejeune. We toured their facilities as well. We talked to sports groups, user groups, event groups. We talked to... Um, people who were involved in churches that would like bigger space for some of their events. There was a lot of interest within the community for a flexible space, um, whether that's indoor or outdoor. We heard a lot of different things. Um, so that led us down the path of phase two, which was the detailed financial forecast and economic impact projections, the feasibility report that you've got in front of you, and ultimately to this final presentation. I'm not going to go through all these bullets, but our methodology for this process is very reflective of our methodology for all of our projects. We want to start with data, make sure that we have the right numbers in place, make sure that those numbers are adjusted and very tailored to this market, make sure that we're not only about numbers, though. We want to understand your community, your um, abilities, your key differentiators that you can offer and determine how those can create the very best possible scenario for going forward into a project. And uh, from there, we did our due diligence and over the course of several months um, produced ultimately the financial forecast and economic impact analysis that today is all about. The most important thing that we do when we're on site, when we're working with the project team, when we are finding out what we need to be considerate of is to define success because um, different communities have different levels of success or different definitions of success and we need to know what you are trying to do and what is going to equal success for you and so we came back with three high level definition uh, definitions of success number one it's about tourism it's about driving non-local visits to this market first and foremost and of course it also serves as a community asset but it does have to create in a year-round function um, as much as possible, uh, the opportunity to, draw, to drive days in market and overnight stays uh, here within Jacksonville. Number two, um, a word that Glenn used a couple minutes ago, enduring. It's got to be not about the current opportunity or about what happens in three years or five years, but if this is a facility, indoor or outdoor, that gets built um, at the time that we were defining success, indoor or outdoor, um, we can't look at the five-year plan. It's a 15, 25, 35, 40-year plan that we're thinking about flexibility and long-term endurance. And finally, cross-functionality. Um, it couldn't be single-purpose um, because there are going to be changes in this industry, the youth and amateur sports industry, just as it was very different 20 years ago and 10 years ago from what it is today. It would be foolish for anyone to go forward saying it will be exactly the same in 10 years and 20 years from now. So that cross-functionality and being able to consider what other uses, even outside of sports, so really about events as well, uh, that the facility could um, 
that could handle and could host and, and could support within this community. So that brought us to the opportunity analysis where we did a much deeper dive. And the first question is, why would you get into this? Um, what is this industry that you're talking about? Is it viable? Is it reliable? And the answer to that, uh, we obviously believe, is yes. Youth and amateur sports is a $9 billion portion of a $200 billion sports tourism industry in this country. It's growing. Um, over the last three years, it's grown over 20%. And in 2014, the 15 numbers aren't out yet, but in 2014, um, almost 29 million people traveled for youth and amateur sports. Um, so these events are happening. They're happening more often. They're growing. Participation in competitive level sports is continuing to incline. Um, actually, um, which is different from the overall trend in youth participation. There are less kids playing today than there were five years ago, but they're playing vastly more games and more um, tournaments. So like that, love that, or wish it wasn't that way, that's the reality of where we are today, and um, it, it creates a need that is different from what uh, was required 10 years or 20 years ago within this industry. And I think one of the most important things to mention is that, you know, um, the recession that we are um, coming out of, out of going back into whatever your position is, um, sports tourism has not declined in a single quarter over the last um, six or seven years. It's the only session, uh, section um, of the tourism industry that didn't decline. So we don't call anything recession proof, but sports tourism has shown to be recession resistant at the very least. So um, that's why you would do it. Now the question is, can we do it? What are the key indicators or pieces of information that we need to consider to determine what the best opportunity is? So we always, we always start with sort of the low-hanging fruit of what the local community looks like and what the sub-regional within 60-minute community looks like. So um, we did a demographic and socioeconomic analysis. There's a lot more detail in the appendix of this for some of the data that we mined there. Um, these are some of the, le the leading indicators, and none of these are strict predictors of success, but they do tell us something about this market and the opportunity and what it's going to mean for you ultimately. So um, I won't go through these numbers, but we've looked at the 15, the 30, the 60 minute. We've looked at the county, and we've looked at the surrounding counties as well to determine what that home base is, if you will, for a tournament. Um, the other numbers there in terms of Median age, obviously, everyone knows that this city is one of the youngest, if not the youngest, in the country. Um, it is growing, particularly um, outside, you know, in the in the surrounding areas from Jacksonville and within Onslow County. We see uh, very good growth, and median household income, which is actually um, a bit skewed by um, all of the youth and the base activities that go on here. Um, but overall, for the cost of living, when you adjust, it's a, a, it's a healthy household income and right on par with what we see across the country. So the people are one thing, but the people who play sports are another thing. So we look at sports participation, and this is where we start to expand past your home base of within 60 minutes and outside into the region. So what we did is we looked at a significant number of sports. These are categorized by highest level participation in the region and what that means when translated into the sub-region and the region. And as you see on this list, basketball is number one by a, a wide margin in terms of um, participation across age groups, followed by soccer, baseball, softball, et cetera. So as you go down the list, you start to understand that there are um, sports that happen on the same surface, like basketball and volleyball, or like baseball and softball, with you know different dimensions but same surface um, and we take that and start to understand the opportunity based on facility type and so we took all of the sports that happen on those facilities or uh, all the participation in those sports on the facilities and condense them into these types of facilities indoor court multi-purpose diamond fields rock gym etc and as we go through the process of understanding again the sub-regional and the regional opportunity um, indoor court still finished uh, sort of above and beyond um, any of the others. But we also uh, recognize that in looking at the goals for year-round utilization and driving as many heads and beds, there's real reason for us to look not just at indoor court, but also at multipurpose long field and at diamond fields. So the next step that we took was to understand um, the total number of events for flexibility. If we talk about cross-functionality within sports, and then obviously there is outside of sports as well, Indoor court, again, 
came up as um, by far the most usable space in terms of its flexibility because with flat floor um, multi-purpose space it's not just about ball sports but it's also about wrestling and taekwondo and what else is happening here in the region um, so anything including even billiards and other um, uh, other types of sort of um, non-primary sports um, indoor court can support 19 of them, long fields, nine different sports, and ice rink, four different sports that are happening here regionally. And as you look across, what became obvious and evident to us was um, the number one opportunity clearly is court. And if you look at the makeup of this community, particularly in the county, when you, when you spread out so that within 60 minutes, that's what's vacant in terms of the ability to serve the opportunity and the need. You've got some great tournament class diamonds, uh, particularly softball fields um, that are, are really high quality. You've got several um, different soccer organizations that have home bases large enough to host some tournaments, and when you combine all of the outdoor long fields that are available within that sort of 60-minute time frame, or certainly at least within the county, um, you have capacity there. And what you can't do is host any large or significant indoor court-based events. So. Um, it became evident based on, again, your definition of success and the opportunity that the number one opportunity for you is indoor court. So um, in recognition of that, when we started to think about what does an indoor court-based facility look like and what are the challenges and the opportunities associated, um, these are some high-level observations that we have. Number one uh, on the challenges side is that the sub-regional population simply isn't that big. You're not in a very large market. Um, there are about 366,000 people, I think, within 60 minutes, which is a little bit less than what we'd like to see. We shoot for that half a million mark um, in order to have a, a really solid home base. So um, we know that the home base perspective is going to um, create some time to develop. The second is accessibility. Um, obviously, while it is a great market, it's not the easiest to get to, especially relative to other um, markets in the southeast, so we're conscious of that that's built into our study and impacts the projections. The reputation of the destination, although you have a phenomenal reputation um, for a lot of things, within sports, uh, despite the fact that you've got a really successful sports commission, you don't have a reputation as a destination for indoor court-based sports because you simply have not been able to host and have had to turn away. So. Um, overcoming that challenge and becoming known to the basketball players and the volleyball players and the wrestlers and the uh, judo athletes and everyone else that could participate, it's going to take some time. And finally, competition. Um, there's not a municipality in the country that isn't thinking about sports and recreation for their community, and because the information is ever-present and much more readily available about sports tourism, there are a lot of communities that are thinking about how to build their sports tourism program. You have a really well-established, early established, one of the first, I think, in the state, sports commissions. Um, but there are other um, groups who have been on the move and are on the move to create competitive assets. There are also a lot of opportunities, though, um, one of them being the presence of your sports commission and the success that you've had. Even on indoor sports with limited capacity or limited ability, you have um, been able to host a number of smaller events that could be the seeds for growing bigger events. Um, quality support services, you've got an industry that um, supports non-locals. You've got a lot more hotel rooms than you would expect for a population of this size or this accessibility. Largely um, largely funded, or uh, not funded, but um, I, I should say powered by the base and base activities. And we know that there are times that um, those activities will fill up a lot of the hotel rooms, so we've been conscious of that as well. Um, maybe the, I'll say most exciting thing, because we do literally get excited thinking about it, the most exciting thing is the potential that you have um, to create a unique and impactful experience driver. And well, when we were here, one of the things that was immediately evident to us is how the Marine Corps is woven into the fabric of, of this community. Um, watching the video of the 75th anniversary event, um, you know, when you have an event, it's clear that you would expect to see a lot of green and a lot of people in uniform. What we were surprised at is they were everywhere when we were here. And um, I, I think, uh, and they were everywhere and they were smiling. And I've got some, some uh, very dear friends who uh, were at Camp Lejeune. Are we a Lejeune or a Lejeune room here? Lejeune. Camp Lejeune, I know who to listen to. So, uh, Camp Lejeune, um, 
Um, we think that that's the type of opportunity that doesn't exist in anywhere. Um, you know, you have the uh, the chance if you go forward and develop something to develop something that leaves a lasting impression on the people who visit here, based on that tie, and um, that's important in in creating a successful event that not only has people coming the first time, but wanting to come back and circling their calendars year after year. And then finally, um, I mentioned it, but the industry is growing. There's a lot of strength and growth in this industry. We expect that trend to continue. That said, we do know that there are some factors that you're going to need to consider. Um, success is going to depend on two primary things. Number one, you have to have the facility that's going to be able to support the level of event that you want to bring in, and the facility has to drive a lot of the experience. So you're going to have to invest in a high-quality, flexible, what we call tournament class facility. And the second thing is that facility is, um, like almost all sports tourism destinations across the country, it's going to require an ongoing commitment to funding for in event incentives to get groups in to play on a regular basis and operationally to um, support the operation and what it's going to take to consistently drive business. <clears throat> so now we'll get into it. Um, here's what we came back with. We went through a lot of different models, started on a lot of analyses. We were able to cross a lot of those off, off as we went through the list. But um, what you see in this feasibility study, what you see in the full pro forma, which is not part of this packet, but there's a, there's a lot of detail behind this, um, many, many numbers. So I'll try to stay clear of spouting them all off. Um, but this is a, a, a facility that we've recommended is just under 90,000 square feet. The primary driver for it is six basketball courts cross line with 12 volleyball courts. It's a model that we're very familiar with in a lot of facilities that we've successfully planned and are part of operations. This is the same size and number of courts as Rocky Top Sports World has in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, as uh, the Round Rock Sports Center in Round Rock, Texas has. Um, and putting it on the map of the regional basis, it would be, um, in terms of a permanent structure, it would be, I think, the third largest in the region behind um, um, behind Myrtle Beach, and uh, there's another, well, I guess you could probably count Boo Williams, I think has eight basketball courts, but only 12 volleyball courts, so that's that's a little bit bigger. Um, so you'd be right there in um, sort of the just under the largest, but it's important to recognize that in this market, that's the right size. Um, we've also additionally recommended a an adventure climbing area that's um, sort of represented in the bottom right. Um, that's called clip and climb is what we've sort of envisioned. We've successfully implemented that at a number of facilities or versions of that at a number of facilities. And that's a differentiator in terms of time on site and being a memorable experience for not just the players, but big brother, little sister, whoever is coming to have something to do that they want to come back to. And they're not nagging to leave as soon as the, the game is done. Um, the administrative space, the um, storage, all of that's built into there. That's how you get to those aren't those don't add up. But the, the total of all the square footage is that 88,000. Um, because of the types of events and because of not just hosting sports, but being able to use this facility for much more than sports, where you have more density in terms of people in the building, we've recommended 530 parking spaces and a total of eight acres needed for the land to develop, including the green space and circulation around um, the parking lot in the building. In terms of cost, um, again, this is a very high-level representation of a lot of costs that are in the full document. Um, but you'll notice that we did not include a land cost for the time being. Uh, we have included everything else from hard cost, field and sport equipment costs, furnitures, uh, ff &E, and then the soft costs. Um, so in total, a $15.7 million investment on the um, total development of the facility, again, not including land costs. So uh, this is probably a good place to recognize it because this is where we get a little um, skewed. Sorry if there are any hard-to-read numbers or if anything's um, a little bit stretched. It looks okay on that board, but um, my version of, of PowerPoint doesn't match up with this version of PowerPoint, so everything got shifted a little bit. Um, so we did our best to reformat it quickly, but um, here's the economic impact summary. The first thing that we do is we analyze your market average daily rate for hotels, average daily meal costs, other opportunities and things that people can do in the market and what they will most likely spend on when they're here based on your market and our experience as operators and our experience in reviewing 
almost every single study that comes out on direct spending from youth and amateur sports. So we've um, layered in all of the expenses that we would expect a person to spend on a daily basis, and it is just under $110, including hotel, eating, uh, transportation, dining, uh, sorry, dining and eating are probably the same thing, um, uh, entertainment, retail, and then there's always a miscellaneous bucket as well. Um, our numbers for events drive the primary um, indicator for uh, economic impact, which is total non-local days in the market. So uh, if you look at the growth, again, it's going to take some time to build this, as um, we would expect. But 18,000 non-local visits up to by year four and maturity, uh, over 40,000 non-local days in the market. And uh, in terms of room nights, that's over 5,000 in the first year, getting up to over 11,000 room nights that are driven through these uh, sports and non-sports events. Economic impact is that 110, almost 109.87, multiplied by the non-local days in the market. So you see that your economic impact in terms of direct spending only, we don't include an indirect spending multiplier, is the um, dark green line there. A little over $2 million in the first year, um, growing to over $4.4 .4 million of direct spending in this market uh, by years four and five. Now, obviously, that direct spending in terms of dollar figures yields real money back to the city and the county, and actually in uh, your tax structure, um, disproportionately large for the county. Um, but there is real new incremental revenue coming in from tax generation um, and multiplying out across your um, your taxes. It's about $100,000 in year one to just over $200,000 by full maturity. In order to get there, we've projected all of the events. Um, we have in-house basketball events, rental basketball events, and rental volleyball events as your three main opportunities for the sort of um, most common sports that would happen. But then we also have non-primary sports events, so anything like wrestling and judo, as I mentioned earlier, all of the other things that happen, uh, pickleball, which is now a travel sport um, as well, all of those types of events. Um, are included there. And then you'll notice, here's a formatting issue, there are five categories on the pie chart and only four lines there. The last one is um, non-sports events. So that seven represents non-sports events. I promise it's in the real thing. It's in your, it's in your, uh, your packet. Um, happened again here. Um, but they have a disproportionate amount of room nights generated by these sports. Um, versus the percent of total number of events. So if you look at in-house basketball events, those um, by year five, three in-house basketball events generate 11%. The big one to note is that you have six rental volleyball events, um, we'll call it versus five rental basketball events, and those six rental volleyball events generate 31% of the room nights projected. That's to say that volleyball is the sport that you'd want to go after for multiple reasons. Number one, you have two volleyball courts per basketball court. Um, number two, this is just a fact and it's numbers based, girls travel better than boys. They spend more when they're here. They stay longer. They do more things. Marginal. And most importantly, <laughs> they don't look for um, the, the all-you-can-eat buffet and the hotel that's going to let them stay 10 to a room. So... Um, <laughs> Uh, we, we do see that across sports. Um, you know, younger sports, lower level sports actually generate a lot more um, economic impact and direct spending than the highest level because those, those players travel so often that they're just looking to do it as efficiently and as effectively as possible. Whereas when you've got your, um, your eight-year-old playing in the first basketball tournament, you can bet that grandma and grandpa are coming along with mom, dad, little brother, big sister, and, and the rest of the crew. Um, so that number, it's a good point, that 110 is the blended average across all sports and events that we've had, and uh, that's your breakdown. So financial performance, economic impact is one thing. Understanding the financial performance is the other piece. Um, and so this is a high-level representation of all of the detailed financials that are in the full uh, pro forma. These are each of the revenue lines. And so you'll see that, for example, in-house basketball tournaments, we don't think that there's an opportunity to run any of them in year one because you're not running very many basketball tournaments now. You're going to have to capture the data, 
develop the relationship with the coaches and the teams and the organizations coming in, and then you can start to slowly, incrementally build your own tournaments. That's an opportunity in basketball, not in this part of the country in volleyball currently, so we haven't projected it. But as you look down, you would see that all of those numbers add up to the total revenue, generating about $490,000 in top-line revenue in year one, up to $843,000 in year five. We have expenses associated. The first are cost of goods sold or direct expenses, the variable expenses of creating that revenue. And then underneath that, the four lines below the first yellow line are the overhead expenses associated with, um, with operations. That's supporting the facility, running the business, uh, the management payroll, and then payroll taxes and benefits for your managers and any part-time support staff um, that are associated. So um, EBITDA, earnings before interest, tax depreciation, and amortization, is actually fairly stable in this model because of the market, because of the opportunity, because of the expense structure here. Um, so it doesn't change that much. It is um, $567,000 to the uh, negative in year one, down to $521,000 in the negative in year five. So when you look through the litmus test for you as a community, um, should be the cost of development and EBITDA. What are we spending in order to generate a return on investment for our community? And so there are two things that we look at. Number one is the economic impact, which we showed you earlier. Again, it's about $2 million in year one, up to a bit over $4 million in year four, so, um, or year four and five. Um, so you are creating four times as much spending in the community as you are spending on the facility. And the second piece of that is what's the net financial impact. So if we look at the city and the county net new tax revenue generation, um, there's real dollars coming in as a result of the direct spending. And so we, um, this is fairly common in the industry, um, consider net financial impact, which is cost of operations, um, and then you add in the net new revenue for the, uh, for the tax generation to create net financial impact of the facility. So if you take the incremental tax revenue, add it to the, um, to the deficit of the facility, you get a number that is lower but still uh, requiring ongoing subsidy. And so, again, the litmus test and the, the reason you hired us is to give you the data so you can make the decision as to whether or not um, this level of financial obligation makes sense for you in order to create the economic impact that's projected. Um, it's also, I think, necessary to think about the benefit of this facility, not just as a sports asset, but also for events. And we've been, um, we've been tasked to look at the economic impact. And so the events that we've projected are economic impact generating events. Um, the uses of this facility in this community, given the not only lack of indoor sports space, but lack of indoor event space for events that it wouldn't hit our line, for example, um, Jazz in the City just created 30 room nights, and um, the 75th anniversary event just created 40 uh, room nights. That that type of event wouldn't hit our, you know, radar for what a facility could support, and certainly Jazz in the City could make use of this facility and be a great community asset for indoor space. Um, there's probably some cross-functionality, as is part of the goal, um, for something like the 75th anniversary event and the Marine Ball and other events that we know the city is hungry to be able to host that it hasn't been able to host in the past. Well, we need that card. Yes. Does the bottom line on the net financial include debt impact for funding the facility? It does not. So it's, it's EBITDA-based. So... Um, that's a great segue into the next piece, which, again, um, this is uh, not a study that is intended to identify the funding solution, but we did um, make sure to provide you with some common funding models. So we break it down into two areas. There's, uh, there are the typical ways that facilities are funded, and then there are, um, from a construction standpoint, and uh, specific ways that facilities are funded from an operations perspective. On the construction side, um, by far the most common form, <clears throat> excuse me, of funding is through borrowing. These facilities, as you can imagine with um, what is a very um, typical, essentially, um, type of subsidization or level of subsidization that a facility of this type requires, um, so that's not performing better than or worse than um, many facilities across the country, um, there is 
typically uh, a, a public sector financing solution and not a private sector solution because there wouldn't be a return on investment. So um, borrowing is typically on um, bond obligations. Uh, GEO bonds are by far the most uh, typical, whether that's a capital investment or requires a voter approval. Um, there could be some revenue bond depending on how you structure it, but because the facility isn't generating a surplus, it's less likely that you would go into um, a revenue bond scenario. And then there are partnerships. While some facilities are public-private partnership, depending on a master development plan or financial performance of a, of a um, unique scenario, um, it is very much more common that there's a public-public scenario. That's what happened in um, Rocky Top Sports World in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. That is a uh, joint venture between the city and the county, for example. Um, we have others that are city and school board, county and school board, et cetera. So public public is um, certainly one of those areas where partnerships come in for funding construction. In terms of operations, uh, that ongoing subsidy um, can be partially backed by uh, by those bonds or others. But there are some additional ways: special districts, uh, TIFs, um, business improvement districts, park dedication fees. All of those being um, unique ways to uh, generate new taxes or obligate land for development for park space or park and recreation space. And then um, probably the most common uh, ways are dedication of hotel occupancy tax and sales tax, whether that is through an increased tax or whether that is through um, a, uh, an existing tax that um, can help to fund. So that's certainly one of the areas that ongoing operations are um, commonly across the country uh, looked at for, um, for subsidization. So that's a lot of talking. Uh, my really quick wrap up is um, we have three goals. The, those three goals uh, were to generate non-local visits in a year-round capacity, to become an enduring asset, and to create a cross-functional asset. And um, what our study has, um, has said to us is that Jacksonville can achieve those goals through the development, most appropriately, of an indoor sports and event center that needs to be built to host events, not just sports. And that in order to do that responsibly and reliably, um, you're going to need to, A, invest in that facility from making it a high-class, uh, high-quality uh, tournament class facility, and also ensure that you've got the ongoing funding structure to make sure that operations are covered and that event incentives are built in to, um, to be able to go out and attract, which obviously the uh, Sports Commission does very well here. We outlined some next steps. Um, that's if uh, you decide to go forward, what the next steps would be to get the building to getting open. I won't run through these. Instead, I'll take a breath and um, turn it over to you to ask any questions that you've got of uh, the presentation, the study, or the industry in general. Evan, thank you. That was a great job. I'll, I'll, I'll start it off by asking you. Um, I was talking to Lamont, Lamont Williams. He and I sit on a board together mm -hmm. from Rocky Mount. Yeah. And they're doing a $34 million project of which they're using tax finance, uh, some tax credits. And apparently, in doing that, they're going to be saving about $7 million. Are you familiar with that project? Um, that, that's probably not your project directly, is it? It's not my project directly. We, are, uh, we were engaged to do, so they had already um, not finalized the design, just the background. They had already determined to go forward. Um, with that project and hired us to do the analysis of what it should be and could do. Um, so they had already had a lot of, actually, I think they planned on it costing a little bit more than that originally. It was going to be a $40 million project, and then they found that funding solution. I'm not directly involved in, uh, in that project, but I can certainly get any of the details that you need. Well, no, again, I was just mainly to identify the tax credits that, you, that they're utilizing mm -hmm. at that project which is going to significantly save them some, some money. That's right. They had the opportunity to um, activate a redevelopment tax, essentially, where the, uh, they had a, a plan and an obligation to revitalize downtown, and where they're putting that facility meets that uh, credential. So what they were able to do is by creating that facility in a special tax district, um, it qualified for the revitalization taxes that they were um, able to then <coughs> Uh, allocate to that project. And one other one other point, uh, just to go back to what you, your early comments were, um, you would be willing to manage this facility with those projections. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So that support those numbers that you presented here today. That's right. 
Yeah, we, um, more casually, we often say if we lie, we die. Um, on the financial forecast, um, we got into management in exactly the situation I mentioned earlier, which was we turned in a study in 2005, and the National Park Service said, this is great, now go do it. Um, so at that point, there was a real question of, um, hey, are we making sure that we get everything right? And we were. Um, but over the time, that's been our ethic uh, going forward. So we don't ever produce something that we don't believe in. Thank um, you. I'll open the floor up. Any questions? I'm sure there's some questions or comments. <clears throat> Anyone? Uh, Evan, the first uh, comment I have is in, when you were when you were doing the projections on the folks that would potentially use this, you left New Hanover County out. Is there any reason for that? Um, it is probably included in the numbers and not in the, um, uh, is it in the back? I don't think it's in the numbers because they, they, what's New Hanover, 150,000? Yeah, we talked about that the last time. You had those in the numbers that we had. Yeah, um, it may have just been, um, from the original numbers, let me see if we. almost two hundred thousand. So and Onslow's right in there. So that right, just those two would be four hundred thousand. We get over the half million pretty quick. Well, if you pick up anything, well, Jones doesn't have much Jones County, but certainly Pender County's got quite a quite a bit of numbers. Did you look at that when you so uh, it's a little bit misleading from the way that these are drawn out. If you look at the map and it doesn't touch that area to the south, those are that's just the 60 minutes. Keep in mind, from an events perspective, we went out to 240 miles, so it is certainly included in uh, in all of the projections we've got for those um, 240 regional numbers. Right. In in your breakdown of cost, uh, use of funds, you have field and sports equipment cost that's for the facility what's the field part of that that's the general designation for um for the sports it, it's the ff and e that is sports specific so um it's always called field and sports but it has even though there are outside fields. no the outside development is under the site development which is under hard costs okay you talked about the eight acres eight or nine acres do you recommend if we were to to move forward with a project um, that we would find a much larger space to eventually add outdoor space or no? So it's certainly something that um, if that's a future goal that you should consider. And the reason is that you're going to save a tremendous amount of money and operational headache by being able to service the outdoor sports and events through the indoor building from a registration, main restrooms, food and beverage, administrative team uh, sessions, etc. So the eight acres is only representative of the space that you'll need to develop the parking lot, the building, and have some green space around it. Mm -hmm. And certainly co-locating if there is uh, the potential for future further development, particularly on outside, um, you definitely want to consider that and weigh that site selection criteria against um, direct proximity to hotels, restaurants, etc. Okay, thank you. Any other? Uh, Steve? Yeah, I've just got one question. The the incremental tax revenue generation, mm -hmm. just to make sure that I understand it. This is solely from the facility, the the increase if we build this facility. So there's already tax from the, from the Sports Commission and sporting events that are occurring here now. Mm -hmm. There's already that. Now, granted, there'll be a slight overlap because we do host some indoor facilities, but this is solely in addition to what's currently. Okay. That's right. That's net. That would be net new tax revenue mm -hmm. generation. And the other thing, you touched on it briefly, was the ancillary uses. Mm -hmm. uh, that the way we talked about designing this such facility was with no pillars, mm -hmm. where we could have convertible floors to host larger events of non-sporting. That's uh, right. Yeah, so that main space that I talked about, that court space, is almost 50,000 square feet of high ceiling, uninterrupted flat floor space. The reality is that we don't have a facility in our portfolio that we um, don't make great cross use out of. In our Texas facility, which has um, 44,000, so just a little bit less, we run three gun shows there and dog shows over that space and community trade show type events. We just cover the space appropriately. Um, the 
the flexibility of having an indoor space with no columns that's flat floor um, extends well beyond uh, sports for sure. Thank you. Richard, I know you had some questions you want to join us? Well, first of all, I want to clarify that the gun show and the dog show didn't occur at the same time. <laughs> no. In Philadelphia, it did. <laughs> Once. <laughs> Once. Once. <laughs> Once. I've got a question. Ernie? Uh, as far as the, uh, on page 12, it talks about, it says critical to the, to that determination is the fact that Jacksonville has no large indoor facility capable of hosting non-sports events and activities. And what is your definition of a large indoor facility? Is there some, like, capacity uh, that you looked at? Uh, and the reason I ask that is there are several groups, and I'm sure everybody can identify with it, uh, that people may belong to, fraternities, sororities, or clubs, or what have you, that want to sponsor district or, or so-and-so meetings here don't have a facility, and we're talking 750 to 800 people. So I'm trying to figure out what type of large indoor facility are you envisioning when you say Jacksonville doesn't have a large indoor? Is there like a minimum uh, square footage uh, that you were looking at? So that the term large is, um, is vague and uh, somewhat subjective, partially on purpose. But the reality is that when we talk to a number of user groups, including the groups that you're talking about, and of course people around this table as well, they said, we simply can't host events that have 500, 600, 700 people. And so depending on those events, whether you're tabling it or whether you're, uh, it's a, a standing event or whether it's a seated ticketed event, um, we just know that there is nothing that would qualify as convention ready space. You've got some spaces that for very small, very small, we'll call it civic center spaces or civic center type events um, have been used in the past, but nothing reliably. And we know that um, some of those biggest spaces belong to the school and belong to the, to the base, and those are increasingly difficult in all communities because of um, safety and separation and all sorts of other things, increasingly difficult to rely on. So um, when we said large, uh, we simply meant that a large meeting space, there's nothing comparable or close to comparable that this 50,000 square feet of uninterrupted space would bring to this market. As an example, Evan, what would 50,000 square feet be able to house be it, from your experience in terms of people or an event? It's going to depend on your local codes and um, and what the fire marshal says you're allowed to do. Um, but we, I want to say that we have um, no problem whatsoever with 1,600 people in about that amount of space in um, our facility in Tennessee. Um, a good example, just to give you an example, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, Ms. Chairman and Mr. Vice Chairman, uh, your new facility, which is excellent, uh, y'all can seat, if I remember correctly, 450 to 500 people in a, in a round table setting, is that right? I don't believe it's quite that many. I think it's more like 300 to 400, uh, depending, depending on how tight you have the tables in there. If you have it where it's comfortable, where people can stand up, walk around, and, and um, I think it's somewhere between three and 400. If and you just had chairs. That, that space is about uh, maybe 6,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about 50,000 square foot area, you're talking about something that is substantial. That's Remember, an acre is 43,560 square feet, so you're talking about over an acre of uninterrupted space. That's right. And I would think that if you set it up in the auditorium style, not tables, mm -hmm. you would get more, uh, yeah. more people in there oh, yeah. and everything. Oh, yeah. So, But again, it's all based on fire marshal and right. I don't know what those details are. Yeah, there's, uh, there's probably uh, an important distinction to make there, which is that the way that we've projected this would not be for um, like a concert type or a main show floor type of an event. Um, we are looking more participative in terms of its design as it currently exists. But the nice thing about all of this is that this is all on paper. So it can change and that can change. But um, if we wanted to bring in more seats, more permanent seats, we'd have to expand restrooms and things like that. But we've also been conservative in the budget. If you were to look at the cost per square foot of this facility versus others, um, we know that especially when we were doing the study, cost of steel was rising. We expect that to equalize. Um, we've been safe. We built in a 10% contingency on all of the line items. We, 
we believe that you'll have flexibility within this budget to be comfortable. Well, why is your cost per square foot estimate 250? No, not nearly that. Um, it was so it's 88,000 and it's about 15. Um, so it's I think it must be right around 170, 175, somewhere in that range, would be my guess. Um, for comparison purposes, facilities that you may well be um, uh, very familiar with. Uh, Myrtle Beach Sports Center finished for about 115 a square foot, built at a very good time and under really good conditions, and they have some some uh, good relationships there. The Upward Star Center, which is a beautiful building, which was built, um, the guaranteed maximum price came in uh, two and a half years ago, and that finished, the indoor facility itself finished for about um, 125 but this facility was designed to be more flexible than that because there aren't um, there aren't the same type of needs for those spaces that there are for this space. Okay, Evan, if I may, just I got another question. Because people are going to be asking this on page 24, which interests me. It talked about the net financial impact. Uh, isn't it quite common to lose money or be in the negative yeah. uh, the first five to seven years before you turn around. I just want the public to understand that, mm -hmm. you know, it is quite common that you're in the red in the beginning until you're able to sustain these events so that, you know, they know that it may not be, you know, you're not going to jump out and start making money right away. Uh, I, want, I, I just want you to expand on that a little bit. for. Yeah, for absolutely. Time. Across even the most profitable sports facilities, um, you typically would expect... Uh, there to be a 24 to 36 month period for it to stabilize and then a four to five year maturation period. Um, it's worth drawing the distinction that this facility has been projected as primarily an event-based facility and just like convention centers never generate a surplus in, in um, operations, um, these facilities don't either if used strictly for this purpose. But the reality is, is that <clears throat> as you go forward as a community and you have more people coming in and you've got more needs and things shift within the industry, um, what will happen is that you'll find efficiencies in operating. And as you've seen, our total operating expenses go up every single year. It's $880,000 to over a million dollars in year five. Operating as efficiently as possible, if you decide that you need to or want to change the operation and get as efficient as possible, you would be able to drop some of those expenses to year one or below operating expenses if the decision is we need to sacrifice some weekend opportunity to generate events in order to generate more revenue, and then that revenue number would come up as well. So the way that we projected it is for an event center, and an event center we would not recommend that you go forward um, under the assumption that it will eventually be surplusing dollars, but there are this type of space is um, able to be over the course of a few years converted into something that can um, get much closer to or even at break even. And they're really designed, most communities support these to build economic growth within the community. Exactly. When you're, you know, injecting two, three, four million dollars in your community, restaurants can thrive and retail can thrive and hoteliers can fill their room. You have to look at a bigger picture than... Right, know, right. The ancillary just benefits. The, are answer, what the you quality provide. of life, right, the activities that you provide your, your residents. You, you have to look beyond, you know, is, is the facility in the black all the time. And that's sort of our job is to view those sort of numbers and to see can they work and can they be sustainable to provide that for our community and, and our partners, which is our business community. Uh, can we help them thrive? And that's, that's what we're here to do, taking the monies that we collect through tourism and, and other uh, uh, areas and, and put it back in to help thrive that even further. And I think that that's, that's what the discussion is here. So Sports Commission, now is the time. Any questions? had the chance to review it I want to give Evan and his team um, you know huge, huge props you guys have done a phenomenal job in presenting this um, and I love the fact that there has been thought given to the additional um, sports is a piece of the puzzle um, <clears throat> in the chamber and tourism and the community will be a part of that partnership and I think it's so important that we all remember that 
Um, while I love the fact that sports is, you know, what's kind of hopefully driving the ship on this because people are willing to spend. I mean, Melody's willing to spend to make sure her daughter has a place to go play volleyball and gets that opportunity. Um, just like I'm sure many of us have, you know, family members that spend on their youth. Um, it's the chance to give Jazz in the City. It's the chance to give the museum a chance, you know, an art gala that's in a larger space. It's the chance to give others the opportunity to use these as a, as a way to showcase this community and all that it can give. Um, so I want to say thank you so much for bringing that into the fold. Yes, thank you very much, Evan. This, this is not a rush study by no means. I think we started this about eight months ago, maybe longer. And we've had multiple, multiple meetings and discussions and, and data. Um, it certainly is not a rushed study, and I appreciate that. But oftentimes, you embark on a study. It comes quick. It comes without a lot of input, and there's not a whole lot you can do with it. I think this is something that we can all take back and, and start to digest and have further dialogue at, at a future meeting and figure out where, <coughs> where we go from there. But uh, thank you for that. Yeah, and I would be I would be remiss if I didn't um, say that this has been a project that's been um, easy for us to work on, largely due to um, Glenn helping to coordinate and all the information that Ashley has been able to provide. In particular, um, this has been uh, it, it made our job a lot easier, and it made our job I think a lot more accurate as well, because that means that sufficient time was taken to ask the right questions. We make adjustments uh, throughout this process. Our, our, our thinking is that we don't have to be right. We want to get it right. And because Ashley had eyes on it and she was providing us with data, because Glenn um, made sure that a lot of different people had their eyes on it. Steve's been on the phone with me like six or seven probably could introduce our, our <laughs> company better than I can at this point. Um, that, uh, you know, it, it's been a lot easier based on that. So thank you, particularly to you two, um, for your support. It's, um, it's, been a, it's been a fun project for us. Thank you. Paul, do you have anything? Barbara? No, I don't have anything. Barbara? A couple different things are... Uh, going through my mind <clears throat> at the present time. You can uh, just write a check over here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I was sure I wasn't invited here for my good look. <laughs> Don't say that. <laughs> um, there, there's a couple dynamics going on. We're talking about a project that um, the if we're simply talking about the finances of it, the, the financial aspect, it will not sustain itself anytime in the future, near future, as far as operational expense. So our secondary profit will be off of additional tourism money coming in, additional heads on beds. However, we at the county and you also are rest you're restrained on how you can spend tourism money. So if we get a large increase in tourism funding, that doesn't mean John Doe Citizen down in Southwest is going to see any reduction in property tax or their uh, commitment to revenue streams to the county because we won't be able to take any of the revenue benefit off of this and augment anything other than a tourism related project so um, that's going through my mind the numbers the finance uh, as most of you know i'm data driven and and always cognizant of how much it's going to cost and how we're going to get there um, so it, it's um, it's a worthwhile project. Um, I I can't speak on behalf of my entire board, but I personally see the benefit to it. I just think our citizens need to realize that um, it is going to be a, a long-term commitment of revenue going in, and the secondary increase in sales tax it would be a benefit coming out uh, along with the tourism <clears throat> coming out yeah, and i think it's important to leave on the note that 
this project here is a discussion between the two tourism boards and we're not talking about general fund tax dollars we're not talking about increasing taxes for the local community we're talking about utilizing the taxes that we collect from other people coming into our community staying at our hotels on the monies that we collect reinvesting it back into our community for quality of life and an increase in revenues for our local business people and uh, uh, hopefully having the ability to have more venues for our local citizens to be able to attend. So I think it's really important that people understand that that is not our intent to, to sure. build a facility of which we're going to ask for more tax dollars. That is not my intent. No, no. And, and that's why I, I bring it up right in the beginning, because it's important to note that if our citizens are expecting this to be a windfall to uh, augment their property tax, it's not going to be that. And at the same time, it's not going to be an impact on their property tax. This is tourism money, and I'm sure you uh, find it the same as I do, and I know Paul does. It, sometimes it's difficult for our citizens to differentiate between the different pots of money. They just see the county or the city spending money, and it, there is a difference between tourism money and property tax money, as is with sales tax money. So uh, I just want to make sure that we're out front and that everyone is aware that we are talking tourism money. Thank you, Barbara. Thank Mike, I, I think also if this project does go forward, we need to do a better job of, uh, or to do a good job to educate our citizens on how big the tour sports tourism industry really is. Mm -hmm. I think the average citizen out there has no clue how much money sports tourism brings to an area. So well, that would be a big I think job. I mentioned earlier Rocky Mount. Um, I just read an article. Of course, you know, <clears throat> when my kids were playing, we'd go to Myrtle Beach, and we would literally play in parking lots. And Myrtle Beach is a huge golfing, you know, community. And now they've got a, a beautiful complex. Uh, Raleigh just announced a private uh, public venture, which I think tourism is participating in a good portion of it. It is not something new. And, it's, and if you travel across the country, I mean, <coughs> sports is a huge economic generator. Mm -hmm. And it really is recession-proof because people spend money with, with their kids playing sports. You know, we all have done it. And uh, it's, it's amazing. And volleyball, I know you mentioned volleyball, but Senator Brown and I had a conversation, and he traveled with volleyball, and that's even worse than soccer. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, you know, and surely it's worse than volleyball. Yeah, and so <laughs> things that we don't even know about. And just for note, we have championship status pickleball fields here. <laughs> uh, so we know all about that. So somebody had a comment? Anyways, oh, Paul? You know, I, I, Carol said it best, and so did Barbara. The key thing here is we have to educate the public. Not the, and the sports commission is one great big thing, and I support what we're trying to do here, but they have to understand the difference between tax money and occupancy tax. The public don't understand the two. Yeah, we right. do because we deal with it all the time because we do it every budget year, but the public, we need to educate them. I mean, it's really important because they, they think it's taxpayers' money. Mm -hmm. It's the first thing they'll say to us. Well, that's, that's a good but educating them, I think, on both sides, both the city and the county coming together somehow and educating the public on what the two pots of money are. Well, I think the next steps are, you know, for everybody to go back, digest this uh, uh, tremendous amount of information you have before you, and I think when we meet again, we can have some dialogue about what the next steps are. I think the next steps would be uh, maybe putting a committee together in terms of site selection or potential site selections. Uh, but we'll we'll deal with that at a further meeting. We still have pieces of the puzzle to put together. Let's go back and digest the data. And uh, without any further information, we'll call this meeting uh, adjourned. What do you think? Well, let me no. Go ahead. <laughs> like, no. Oh, we got more. Yeah, I, I'd like to make three comments if I can. First of all, Evan, you and your company, thank you for bringing back a document that we requested. Is this pretty much? 
is what we had asked for, and you brought us back what we asked for, and we compliment you and your company for that. Second thing is, thank you for the uh, commissioners being here, Barbara and mm -hmm. Paul, for being at the table and <clears throat> adding your comments. And the last thing I'd say is for the public out there, this is not a done deal. Mm -hmm. As soon as this $15 million price tag hits the, yeah. the public, they're going to think that we've committed $15 million. We've committed nothing. We commissioned them to give us a study to show us where we were and what it would cost to go forward. We now know what it's going to cost to go forward, and that decision is yet to be made. And, and as the chairman just said, our next step is to get together and, and start planning on how to implement this information that's been presented to us. So I think it's very important for the public to understand we have not spent a penny here today, and we're not going to spend a penny anywhere in the future until all of the information is available to, to make that decision. I think that's important. Good point. Um, I guess staff comments. Glenn? We are seeing if there are any instructions that you wanted from us or anything to that effect. There no, I think we just, you know, again, let's, let's digest the information. Uh, we'll set up a future meeting date. And um, we'll, we'll go from there. I think we've done enough work with that today. Um, I thank all of you for being here. Um, Evan, thank you for traveling. And thank you for your uh, dedicated support on this project. We want to thank our golden rule. Uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> wake up. John, wake up. Wake up. <laughs> what? What? We have a great time doing what we do. That's all I'll tell you. Thank you. I have a motion to adjourn. So moved. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Meeting's adjourned.